Today on People Now, Lori Lachlan terrified about new charges in that college admissions scandal. We have the newest details. A People exclusive, Sister Wives star Maddie Brown opens up about her daughter's rare condition. Also today, baby right. driver. <laughs> Babies can't sing, they can drive, <laughs> but we all know they can't sing. Things are getting wild with Ken Jeong. He is talking mass singer, crazy rich Asians, and paying tribute to first responders. Country stars Maren Morris and Ryan Hurd are expecting. Find out what they're saying in the big announcement. Also, that's kind of what Daybreak is about, is about finding your tribe and finding the people that help you get through hard times. Matthew Broderick's expert advice and more from the cast of Netflix's Daybreak. It's all today, live on People Now. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to People Now. Great to see you. If you need a little motivation to kind of get through the rest of the week, you're in luck. Selena Gomez dropped her new song, Lose You to Love Me. That's the name of it. She dropped it Tuesday night. Take a quick listen. I like it. Yeah, me too. We're going to have this on repeat all week, obviously. The lyrics of the song detail a toxic relationship and how Selena is standing stronger than ever now that she's come out on the other side of the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, so she says the song was inspired by many things that have happened in her life since releasing her last album. And while she didn't reveal the specific inspiration, fans are convinced it was written about her on and off again relationship with Justin Bieber. No surprise that that would be yeah. the perception. In one lyric, she sings, set fire to my purpose. And I let it burn could be in reference to the 2015 album Purpose. Or just from using Beebs. the word purpose. Or maybe it's a word he said and then she also said it. But it was the you know, it was like a big word for him. Yes. So maybe. In a later verse, she sings, In two months you replaced us like it was easy. Fans obviously think this is referring to how quickly Justin and Haley Baldwin got together. That does make sense. Now, regardless of who the song is about, it's a new favorite here at People Now. So in honor of her dropping this single, we want to know which Selena Gomez single is your all-time favorite. Is it her popular jam, Come and Get It? Maybe you prefer Hands to Myself. You might love her collab with Marshmallow on Wolves. Or maybe it's the newest single, Lose You to Love Me. Answer in our People poll and tweet us your thoughts using the hashtag People Now. We're going to check in on all of that drama a little bit later. But for now, here's what you need to know and what's trending for today. Meghan Markle stepping out Tuesday evening to lend her support to inspiring young leaders across the globe. The 38-year-old arrived for the opening ceremony of the uh, One Young World Summit in a purple midi dress with long sleeves. She paired with navy heels. Our fashion team were all about this and her bouncy blowout. Megan is fiercely passionate about the Global Forum, which brings together 2,000 young people from over 190 countries around the world to promote social impact. Megan's latest outing comes as a royal source reveals in this week's People cover story that Prince Harry and Megan are, quote, fine in the wake of their emotional and revealing ITV documentary. In that doc, Meghan opened up about her private pain in dealing with tabloid scrutiny as her husband, Prince Harry, fears that she will suffer the same way his mother, Princess Diana, did. Insiders say that the royal couple increasingly have been seeking help outside the royal household from lawyers, friends, even PR professionals in the U.S. One source says the couple clearly have their own ideas and ways of doing things, saying, quote, they want to plow their own field, certainly, but their openness, it flies in the face of royal precedent, with royal biographer Penny Jr. saying, there's been long tradition in the British royal family of writing criticism out and keeping your head down and taking the long view. She adds, quote, crises come and go. People get criticized, often for five minutes by the media, who then move on. Now, Harry's grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, took the never complain, never explain approach. That same approach has been adopted by Harry's brother, William. Insiders say that the tension between the brothers has added to Harry's feelings of isolation, while Meghan has had her own as she raises her son in a new country far from her L.A. home. A source close to the royal household says Harry sees the pain of his wife and the attacks that she faces. He wants to try to sort it out. But ultimately, the source believes his strategy with the press will backfire long term, saying, quote, it's kind of heroic in a way, but also misguided. It would be better to build relationships with the media. That was their quote. And we'll have more on the dynamics within the royal family and Harry's fears over the parallels of his mother's life to that of Meghan's. That's later on in the show. Stick around. All right, Lori Lachlan, terrified about the new charges that she and her husband, Massimo Giannulli, are facing, with a source telling people that the stress is, quote, about to break them. On Tuesday, the U.S. Department of Justice said in a press release that Lachlan, Giannulli, and nine other defendants conspired to commit federal program bribery by bribing employees of the University of Southern California to facilitate their children's admission. They have been charged with one count each of conspiracy to commit federal programs bribery, and a source close to Lachlan says... They feel like this is David versus Goliath, saying, how do you go up against the federal government when the government has decided to make an example out of you? How can you possibly move forward from this? 
Federal programs bribery is defined as theft or bribery of an organization that receives more than $10,000 in federal funds. According to the U.S. Penal Code, the charge carries a penalty of up to 10 years in federal prison. Prior to the new charges, the couple each faced charges of money laundering conspiracy, conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud, and honest services mail and wire fraud. They previously faced up to 40 years in prison each and have pleaded not guilty. Since the newest charges were brought against Lachlan and Giannulli, the sources say the actress is feeling a mixture of emotion. She's angry, she's sad, most of all, she's terrified, according to them. That source adds that Lachlan feels like she's a scapegoat, explaining, quote, you have to remember, Nothing new has happened. They could have charged her with all of this last spring, but they waited. At Showtime, people were still waiting for a comment from Lachlan's rep. Let's move on to this story. Sister Wife star Maddie Brown opening up exclusively to people about her newborn daughter's rare condition that causes limb malformation. In this week's issue of uh, The Reality Star details the moments leading up to and following the baby's diagnosis. It was during a usual 45-minute ultrasound that Brown knew something was wrong because it turned into a two-hour procedure. Brown says after, quote, looking and looking, the doctor finally asked her to meet him in his office, telling her, I can't find all 10 fingers. That's when her unborn baby was diagnosed with a congenital anomaly. It's called oligodactyly, which is defined as the presence of fewer than five fingers on a hand. Despite having lots of emotions, Brown tells us, quote, I was relieved because there could have been a whole lot more wrong. However, there was. When the 23-year-old and her husband, Caleb Brush, welcomed their daughter, Evangeline Cody Brush, on August 20th, their newborn was missing a thumb, a toe, and one of her legs was missing a fibula, also known as the calf bone. There was also a bowed tibia. In addition to that, two of Evangeline's fingers were fused together. Brown, who is also the mom to a two-year-old son, Axel James, says she was shocked. She tells people, quote, I was just sitting there trying to comprehend what's going on, having just had a baby, as they are bringing in all these specialists, I was freaking out. Well, after birth, Evangeline was diagnosed with fibular aplasia, tibial, campomelia, and fatco syndrome, which is an extremely rare genetic disorder that affects bone formation in utero. The cause of this condition is unknown, and because the disorder is so rare, it's difficult to anticipate how Evangeline's future will look. The family has to wait until Evangeline turns one so that her body has more time to develop. At that time, Brown and her husband will consider some options, including surgery and amputation. Brown admits that she was initially hesitant to speak out about her daughter's condition, but now she's hopeful. She says, quote, there will be limitations, but not huge hindrances. She also reveals her plans to love her baby unconditionally, saying it's abnormal and it catches people off guard, but I want her to grow up and feel proud about who she is. Brown also hopes to help others dealing with the same issue, adding, quote, so little is known about this, so I hope to bring awareness. For more on this story, be sure to pick up an issue of People. It's on newsstands Friday. All right, well, the internet is going crazy over the new Paris 2024 Olympics logo. After the Paris 2024 Olympics account released the logo Monday, users began debating what exactly it looks like. Now, according to France 24, the logo is supposed to combine the three symbols of the medal, the Olympic flame, and Marianne, the personification of the French Republic since 1789. Yes, but Twitter users are having none of that, jumping online to have their say, as they always do. This user thought the logo looked pretty similar to Jennifer Aniston, writing the Paris Olympic logo is just Rachel from Friends. <laughs> I see it. Yeah, it, yes. In some <laughs> ways, I do. One user suggested that after seeing the haircut, the Paris 2024 Olympic logo would like to speak to the manager. <laughs> Other users immediately saw a resemblance to the dating app Tinder and the Flame logo for that. That's actually yeah, the most spot this on. this user seen. writing, swiping left on this Olympics logo. I don't hate it. I really like. I actually really like the font. No, yeah, I actually do too. But that comparison is the most. Is, yeah. The most convincing one I've seen. Uh, so while the logo has divided the internet in a ferocious debate, <laughs> the organizer said in a statement, according to France 2024, the logo uh, or the goal remains to honor French culture and creativity. For the first time, organizers explain the logo will be used for both the Olympics and Paralympics Games, adding it expresses the pride of a country which will welcome the world in 2024, its capital city, Paris. I don't hate it, but I do see a woman now with that hair. It's hard not to see a woman Because you hair. see the lips, too. But you're kind of, I don't know, whatever. There it is, everybody. Andrew, you've well, got going more, with. more force of Star Trek. <laughs> yes, I do. We are kicking off Star Trek today with one celeb who's getting real about plastic surgery. Watch. I had this thing where they lifted up my mouth. And then for the first, like, week, I'm like, I couldn't feel my, I can hardly feel my mouth now, to be honest with you. <laughs> but 
Sharon Osbourne <laughs> isn't afraid to speak candidly about going under the knife and the complications that can come from it. The 67-year-old appeared on The Kelly Clarkson Show on Tuesday, where she discussed her most recent experience with plastic surgery. After Kelly praised Sharon for always being so honest about her surgeries and admitted that she was too scared to get plastic surgery herself, she asked Sharon if she ever gets scared too. Sharon joked in response, saying, I am sure you could go in and wake up like Cyclops. You never know. <laughs> and while Sharon has previously opened up about her satisfaction with her new facelift, she also admits to Kelly that her surgery came with a few snags. But it's like all numb and like it was like I had it, it was up at one side and I looked like Elvis. And and all the kids in Aussie are going, why are you snarling at me? I'm like, I'm not snarling, I'm not doing anything. Sharon first debuted her new look on the talk's season 10 premiere and explained that she got her neck done and everything lifted up for a more refreshed look. Sharon originally shared her plans to get a quote new face back in May and revealed at that time that the surgery was already booked for August. Her decision to get more surgery comes years after the star swore off plastic surgery. In 2012, she revealed on the talk that she would look at pictures of herself and think, I should never have done that. I love how open she is about the whole process and she's really funny about it. All right, now we move on to some baby news. My boys can swim! I can do it! 2020 is going to be a big year for country stars Maren Morris and Ryan Hurd. The couple announced on Instagram on Tuesday night that they're expecting their first child together. The news comes about a year and a half after their March 2018 wedding. Now, referencing her most recent album, Maren wrote on Instagram, quote, The irony is just too rich that after a year of living in the girl headspace, the universe would give us a baby boy to even things out. See you in 2020, little one. A pregnancy announcement and sex reveal all in one. There you go. In the shot, Maren is cradling her baby bump as she sits next to her husband, who sweetly rests his forehead on hers. It's very beautiful. Ryan also celebrated the upcoming addition to their family on Instagram. He captioned his pregnancy announcement, starting with an iconic Seinfeld line, that, that clip that we saw, writing, my boys can swim, baby boy heard 2020. He added, look at her. Cannot believe this life with this girl. Also, thank you, George Costanza, for this caption that I've been sitting on my entire life. On Twitter, Ryan shared Marin's due date, writing, look at her, can't believe it, see you in March, baby. The news comes months after Marin told people, if you're gonna get married, you have to have those talks beforehand anyways, and I definitely know that I want a family, and he would be such an amazing dad, he's such a kid himself. I love his family, and he loves my family. The couple met in 2013 when they wrote a song for Tim McGraw in Nashville. They sparked up a friendship over the next couple of years before going public with their romance in 2016. Ryan proposed in July of 2017, and they exchanged what they called sentimental AF vows in March of 2018, <laughs> I love that. Marin previously riled up fans on social media, which she opened up about family planning during a 2018 Twitter Q&A, saying in part, I literally have it blocked out on my calendar next year. Their upcoming bundle of joy will join Marin and Ryan's fur babies, a white German shepherd named June, and a French bulldog named Pancake. Congrats to the happy couple. Now watch this. This place is beautiful. It's like the perfect holiday card. Snow hides a lot. It's like the spanks of weather. You can do a lot worse in this place, trust me. Tell her that you like her. And I've noticed since I was five years old, it's not that easy. You just have to tell her you want the same relationship plus boning. Tobin! Yeah. Hey, what's up? Yeah, I'm up good. See you downstairs when you found a bra. <laughs> Leave it to Netflix to make being trapped in a snowstorm look enjoyable. The streaming service released the first trailer on Tuesday for Let It Snow. It's one of the films in a slate of holiday movies scheduled for this winter. Netflix describes Let It Snow as feel good and romantic. It's based on a collection of short stories by Maureen Johnson, Lauren Miracle, and John Green. Yes, that John Green. The movie follows a group of small town high school seniors amid a snowstorm, circumstances that allow their love lives and friendships to evolve. The ensemble cast is led by Netflix favorite Kiernan Shipka, who also stars in Chili Adventures of Sabrina. There's also Lady Bird's Odea Rush, Santa Clarita Diet's Liv Hewson, Descendant star Mitchell Hope, and Dora's Isabella Moner. There are a bunch of other stars as well. But just because it's a group of accomplished actors doesn't mean we won't get to see them go through the awkwardness that comes with being a teenager in love. Watch. That girl and I had the thing. Have you ever been with someone and you stay up until like 4 a.m. just talking about everything and you're just like, I can't believe I get to exist at the same time as you? No. But, like, I'm really happy for you. I realize that life is just a bunch of stuff you can't control. But is that a bad thing? Yeah. Anything can happen. Good, bad, anything. <laughs> I 
if she's hooking up with them. No, they're not hooking up. Yes. I love this. Gets me in the winter spirit. I like the right? soundtrack. Let us know his Netflix November 8th and those are your Star Tracks for today. All right, stay with us. She's an American icon, Vanna White, giving us an exclusive tour of her glamorous dressing room, her pre-show rituals, and much more. What is in her fridge? Find out. Plus, the cast of Daybreak is revealing the hilarious thing they taught their co-star Matthew Broderick and their pro tips for surviving the apocalypse. Get ready to take some notes here. That is coming up in just a bit. All right, here we go. The doctor is in. He's a judge on the hit Fox series, The Masked Singer, and you definitely know him from his memorable roles in both Crazy Rich Asians and The Hangover. Yes, here to talk to us today about National First Responders Day. Please welcome to People Now, Ken Jeong. Welcome. Thank you guys for it's having good me. Good to see you. Good to we were just connecting over Laura Morano and yes. the Morano family. And yeah, they are, the Morano family them. are family friends of ours because uh, Laura's mother runs an acting school in Agora Hills, and my daughter Zoe has taken classes with the Morano family for years, and Laura and Vanessa and Ellen uh, are were taught Zoe. So you know, great. they taught Zoe how to act correctly. Okay, you know? right. Yeah. I would tell Zoe, "This is how you act, girl. Over the top. Oh, yeah. Look down the barrel of the camera." <laughs> and the Morano family corrected her. Yeah. So you're like, "Here's how you jump out of a trunk." <laughs> You know, the last time we saw you was that I'm saving for next year. Okay. okay. The last yep. time we saw you is the VMAs carpet last year with Amber Rose. It was an unlikely <laughs> yeah. pairing. That's an unlikely pairing on the red carpet. Yeah. You know, I look like Amber's accountant on the red carpet. <laughs> I look like one of her squad. And I just, she's, I, she's like, "Hey, Ken." I'm like, "Hi, Amber." Yeah, I'll see you at Chili's for the brand meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We're going to talk about your work for a National Responders Day in just a quick bit. But let's mass singer. We were talking about this a bit yeah. ago. Such a huge hit. Did you get a sense that this was going to take off in the way that it has? I mean, the first season, obviously, then even in Korea, it was big before coming here. I knew it would be a fun show, but I had no idea. None of us had any idea it would be, you know, the number one show on TV. In terms of viewership, it is like in, it, the, the people have responded. And like my mom, I'm of Korean descent, and, and it's the number one show in Korea. And it was actually my mom who told me to do the show. Really? Because, yeah, she was, because when I got offered this, wasn't, you know, wasn't really, I've never done a panel show before, and my mom was like, <laughs> she said, this will be good for your career if you do it. I swear. I'm not even kidding. It's like, so mom, it was, have you seen anything else I've yeah. done? Because and the career goes, is on no. fire. No, and she said, no, but she, she, she knew the show uh, would be a big hit. My mom, it, basically, I did the show to please my mom. Uh, well, it and your kids out. love watching. Do you watch together? Is it yes, a family thing? Yes, yeah. we watch it together. And it, it's so, it really is, for my money, like the number one family show to watch because it, it, people of all ages can watch it. You know, we, you know, like my wife and I, we watch it for, you know, you want to see who's under the mask. But I, I just think just the overall kind of gestalt of it, the overall aesthetics of the show just lends itself to like, kind of event family viewing. It's, it's, the sum is greater than this part. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. celeb reveal has shocked you the most? Um, the winner of the first season, it was T-Pain. None of us had any idea. And it, and it was an emotional reveal because T-Pain was famous for you know, auto-tuning. And so, so the fact that not, not a lot of people knew or they forgot that he could, he's an amazing singer, an amazing vocalist. and. He was just nailing every take of it, like, yeah. It made it even more of like a sneak attack. Like, wait, him? <laughs> yeah. Uh, be honest though, something that would surprise us about one of your fellow judges, what would it be? What has stood, stood out to you? Uh, like, I think Robin Thicke is hilarious. Just off, like they're, they're, they're really capturing that. Um, like it, they'll show like kind of in between commercial breaks or while we're getting last looks, we're getting makeup. I don't need any perfection. But <laughs> it's but what Robin does a lot. When he gets his hairspray all over and he gets paid in hairspray. He he'll he just he will just tease me and just like there's a lot of there, there there's a lot of brotherly love. Like we'll we will go at each other in yeah. between in between takes and it you know it's just been so much it's been so much fun yeah so. besides the mass singer you're also going to be in the live action lady in the tramp very yes. exciting your kids must be stoked for this right oh yeah my kids i mean it, it's it's very it's an honor to be a part of that classic and the and the reboot of that and my dear friend yvette nicole brown from community is one of the main leads of that so that was a big reason for me to do the film so it was just to be a part of a classic and i believe it's coming out next month and then to see friends of mine yvette nicole brown and 
and also Adrian Martinez. They have, it, it, I'm, I'm really excited for everybody in that film. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and looking at your career, obviously, m many of the things you've done, kids couldn't watch. Is it kind of nice to have this, <laughs> this new era where they can? And what have they attached to the most that you've done, actually? You know, what have they attached most to me is community. Okay. They love... And they, they don't like it because of me. I'm probably their least favorite character. It's like they look away when you're on screen. Yeah, they, they really don't something. care. They yeah. watch all the episodes that I'm barely in or not in. And <laughs> and it, they they really love I think Dan Harmon, who created uh, the show and wrote the show, he, he's a genius. And now my kids, they would be on set as uh, when they were like toddlers. They would just be hanging out on set. But now the fact that both my kids, they re really appreciate the writing yeah. of Dan Harmon and the whole writing they crew. It. They get it. Yeah. And it's so fun to see my kids really watch a show and they're looking uh, they're looking to find the jokes which is like that does a uh, old man comedian proud yeah. like they're really trying to find the jokes of the writing to see if they can and it's and I believe they're they both do well in their creative writing classes at school and I believe like it's a good adjunct because it really is one of the best written shows you know in comedy history and so they have a flow to their writing and I, I believe like community almost indirectly has a hand in that. You Makes know. sense. Yeah. Yeah. You play a lot of eccentric roles, but what is it like when you're just home with the wife, with the kids? Are they a good test audience? Do you ever run things by them? Um, no. <laughs> and, but I, but I am, I, I'm, I am, uh, I, I, for me, I'm always just resetting at home. I'm pretty quiet and I'm the kind of guy that wears the same clothes every day. So I have like, you know, like, I'm like basically a middle-aged man at home yeah. with a bunch of <laughs> Gap shirts, Gap jeans, <laughs> you know, and I'm wearing like, and I'm wearing like uh, a Kirkland brand, like those generic, you know, socks. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> And they're like women size six. They're literally <laughs> from my wife. They're like, but I have the same size foot. And I'm like, I just wear that. And I wear it every day. So okay. for them to see me in this, especially you get up like this, they will be surprised. Like, yeah. who are you? Who big, are you? Big shout out to Kirkland Socks. Guys. Yeah, big shout out to Kirkland Brand Socks. In women's. Uh, in women's. <laughs> Find your ankles with Kirkland Brand Socks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, real quick. Crazy Rich Asians. Yep. Everyone wants that sequel. What can you tell us? Um, what, what, what I can tell you is what you just told me. Everything is a, pretty much under wraps, right? I, they know that I will be there for the, their family to me. And to be a part of that movie was honestly the biggest, I would have to say the most important highlight of my career because to see that kind of representation on screen mm -hmm. and to be a part of that, that's a game changer for all of us in the Asian American community. So for me to have even, to, to be even a remote part of that family, I take so much pride because I'm thinking of my kids, I'm thinking of my daughters. They, if they want to get into the business, to see that kind of representation by friends of mine that are, that are huge stars now. You're talking about Aquafina, Constance Wu, Henry Golding, every Gemma Chan. Game changer. Game changer. John Chu is the director, Kevin Kwan, everybody. It's just the biggest names are in that movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You've been yeah. really open about your wife having to go through breast cancer. She's a survivor. She's yep. been a decade. She's been a yeah, decade she's since she's 11 she years cancer-free. Yeah, so how important is this month for you? What does it mean to you and your family? Um, it's the most important thing to me, family-wise and personally. And I, I've actually gone um, to different hospitals and to just speak of breast cancer awareness and the importance of getting screening. And and um, I've been uh, just doing just talks around the country and went to, uh, I attended the Gilda Gala in LA over the weekend where I received an award for just kind of um, being a part of the community, but really uh, that award not only is really for my wife, who is an 11 year breast cancer, uh, breast cancer survivor, but I also had all my, all my friends that had helped me and Tran out that during that time they were all sitting at our table and we also had our oncologist that Tran still sees, you know. Uh, you know, once you're a cancer survivor, you're, you know, she just had an appointment last Wednesday. So to have our oncologist who saved my wife's life, to have her there, to have him there at that table, um, really was the most, one of the most uh, impactful things I've, I've, I've been a part of. It's incredible, and you use your platform for good causes. You're now teaming up with Heineken for National First Responders Day. Yes. This is coming uh, Monday the 28th. Let's take a quick look at a campaign clip. Roger that, on my way. You know the best way to celebrate National First Responders Day for those on call? Beer, the alcohol-free kind. 
Happy First Responders Day! Oh, hey. oh sweet ride! Check out mine. <laughs> the only problem, I have to be my own sirens. Woo! Emergency beers for emergency first responders. Let's get this highly responsible alcohol-free celebration started. <laughs> I love that you're doing this. How'd you get involved in this initiative? Well, for me, like being a being a physician, being a physician myself, you you know, for me to be a part of this campaign, you you want to celebrate basically all the first responders who have sacrificed their lives, their time away from their families to be on call. And as a physician, I've had the privilege of also taking call um, with first responders when I was practicing. I would actually go uh, once every once every few weeks, I would be on ambulance call where I would go to ICU units and, and be part of the critical care transport team. So, you know, to really see they are the heroes. They, as a doctor, we get all the information. Oh, this is a 28 year old male complaining of cough, chest pain. We get that all from the first responders. Yeah. We get all that informatics. And, you know, it's to celebrate uh, being, first, being first responders with Heineken Zero Zero. It's an amazing campaign. And everybody in that campaign, they're all real first responders. And so it, there's an authenticity to this that I really relate to as a physician and it, it really is, it was an honor to be a part of this, it really was. As someone who's in, encountered so many first responders, what do you think it is that makes them tick? They're, they're the unsung heroes, it's not ego. What, what, what's behind it in terms of what you have observed? Just a genuine willingness to take care of people and it's not to get credit for it. You know, it's like the first responders, they never get credit for, they're often the ones saving their life. They're often the ones doing CPR. They're often the ones running code blue. I mean, you know, they're doing defibrillators. You know, they're doing everything. And sometimes it's, you know, it's just like in anything in, in acting where, you know, it's not just the lead actors or the doctors, you know, that get the, it's, it's a team effort. It takes a village. And the first responders are the most important part. Oh. So, so to me, this campaign really resonates, and and it's you know um, even if I wasn't part of this campaign, I'm I, you know I really do salute and celebrate the first responders, and I'm just so glad. And again, as a healthcare professional, and my wife's still a doctor, and you know we all recognize the importance of of doing that, and. Um, uh, you know, it's it's an honor to be a part of this yeah, campaign. Good for you. Yeah. All right. Ready for a little game before you go? Yes. Okay. Because the Mask Singer airs tonight, and since you're an expert on celebrity and masking, oh yes, I'm smart. To I'm the smartest judge in on a the new game singer. that we're calling One Hit Wonder Who Sang That. Okay. Oh. All right. Oh, okay. We're gonna play a clip of a song. You and Jeremy are gonna guess the celeb singer. Get ready. And it's multiple choice. And get ready. So, and I actually haven't gotten the answer. No, you have kept it all from yeah, me. Yeah. So, so let's I'd... play the first song. She take my money when I'm in need. So who sang that part? That's the intro. It was at Ray Charles, Jamie Foxx, 50 Cent, or Eddie Murphy. Oh, you can go first. Well, no, you go first. You go first. Okay, fine. I'm gonna say Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx. It is Jamie Foxx. Okay. Oh, but it could have been, it could have been a sneak yeah. attack and it's actually like yeah. Ray. Okay. All right, let's play the next clip. I've been waking up drenched in sweat. Oh All right, is that Post Malone? Is it Ansel Elgort? Jaden Smith or Cody Simpson? Oh, I think I got this. Yeah, I actually don't know this one. Well, you go first in that case. <laughs> <laughs> I've given my card, I feel I mean, like I do know it. Yeah, uh, Post Malone? Uh, I say Post Malone as well. It's actually Ansel Elgort. We both are you, we yes. both that's a, no, we, we're going the same way. I, I, I was gonna was, say Post. I know, I thought <laughs> he was such a good singer. And the music Ansel video. Ansel Elgort? Is his yes. voice affected? What? No, anyway. you guys, and All watch right, the music video. He's a baby video. driver. We'll review this no, later. I know. He's a baby no. driver. This blows my mind too. <laughs> he's not a supernova. <laughs> he's got a great voice. Baby All right. driver. <laughs> Babies can't sing, they can drive. <laughs> But we all know they can't sing. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's play the next one. <laughs> Ooh, that it's feels good. It's called Supernova. Is it Blake okay. Lively, Taylor Momsen, Leighton Meester, or Lucy Hale? Mm, I'm gonna say Lucy Hale. I'd say Leighton Meester. Yep, Leighton Meester. Oh, oh my God! Ding, 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 takes the lead. Oh my God! <laughs> I never get anything right. This is this is a new vibe for me. Okay. All right, let's oh play God. the next one. Is it Kim Kardashian, Kris Jenner, Khloe Kardashian, or Kendall Jenner? Ooh, Kim. 
You know, I, yeah, I actually say Kim too because it's, it sounds, yeah. It is Kim Kardashian. Woo! Ah. <laughs> that, okay, All right, I'm last one. Let's play it. If I was rich, uh, I'd still be with you. So it's obviously a cover, but Jennifer Coolidge, Alicia Silverstone, Gwyneth Paltrow, or Kristen Chenoweth. They sang it on Glee. Okay, uh, 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 can, you, again? can you repeat the choices? Yes, Jennifer Coolidge, Alicia Silverstone, Gwyneth Paltrow, or Kristen Chenoweth. I'd say Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm going to say Alicia. It is Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh! Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. I Great think that job. takes the win. Dude, this is the spinoff where, like, I'm the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I'll never leave. I will never leave. Please don't leave, but thank Get you. Get another guest, and I'll just <laughs> play one-hit wonder at the end of every segment. I'm never going to leave. This is not a bit. This is a real-life situation. Really committed. Thank you for There's being here. There's a lot of tension here. It's great to I'll talk never to you. Leave. We'll house you in the green room later for yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the duration. All right, don't forget to tune in to The Masked Singer, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. on Fox, and Lady and the Tramp is available on Disney Plus November 12th. Check it out. Wheel of Fortune's Vanna White has worn over 7,000 gowns during her 37 years on the hit game show. Now she's taking people on a backstage tour of her dressing room on the studio lot to show us how she chooses what to wear. So she revealed to us that all of her dresses are borrowed, adding, quote, designers will send about 40 options. We choose the top 12 because we take 12 shows in two days. The shoes are all mine, though. But which type of gown does she like best? That's the question. She tells us, quote, I prefer the cocktail length dresses so I don't have to worry about tripping, which totally makes <laughs> sense. In the tour, Vanna also shows off her jewelry drawer. She tells us they're all costume and she gives us a sneak peek into her mini fridge. Here we go. As for Vanna's secret pre-show ritual that day, well, watch. You know, I wear a lot of sleeveless dresses, so I try to keep my arms in shape. So before the show, I have my 10-pound weights. Literally, I stand in front of the mirror and I do I do weight so I can, you know, have a little muscular arms. So that's what I do. Before the show, <laughs> work it out. Got to get those biceps popping, right? <laughs> Vanna is also opening up to people about finding happiness after heartbreak. So she began her career at Wheel of Fortune in 1982, and so much fame and admiration came with it. Yeah, but four years later, in 1986, tragedy struck when Vanna's fiance, the young and the restless actor John Gibson, died in a plane crash. She tells people, quote, the second I hear about it, I fell to my knees. It was just devastating. Vanna credits the love and support from Wheel of Fortune fans for helping her cope, saying this, I heard from so many people who had shared the same experience of losing someone instantly in an accident, and that really helped me. I didn't feel like I was alone, because when something like that happens, you immediately think you're the only one. Vanna later married restaurateur George Santo Pietro in 1990 and became pregnant with her first child. She announced it on Wheel of Fortune, then tragedy struck again, and she miscarried just a week later. There is good news, though. She was able to get pregnant again, and now she has two children, Nico and Gigi. She and George divorced amicably in 2002. And today, Vanna is dating real estate developer John Donaldson, whom she met at a barbecue. She tells people that her relationship with John just works, adding, quote, he lets me be me. I will tell you, as a fan of Wheel of Fortune, I watch it all the time, mm -hmm. I really loved hearing from her. It was so interesting yes. to get some of the details about her. I know, and to read more about Vanna White, pick up the new issue of People on Newsstands Friday. All right, let's move on to this. 17 months after a fairy tale wedding that enchanted millions, followed by Archie's joyous arrival in May, the veil is beginning to be lifted on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's life behind the scenes as the two reveal with raw candor their anguish with family rifts and tabloid scrutiny. Here to discuss all of that is our royal expert, People's senior news editor, Aaron Hill. Thank you for being here, Aaron. Hi. Yeah. Yes. Good to talk to you. There's a lot to get to. Let's start with this. You know, Meghan Markle, she's faced a lot, whether that be tabloid rumors and criticism, you know, also being a new mom, being far from friends and family. When you saw that interview where she said no one asks if she's okay, you really feel for her, you want to console her. How is Meghan different than any other royal that we've seen, any other royal uh, spouse? Yeah, I mean, aside from being American, Megan is incredibly candid and open, and she's always been really outspoken and strong in her beliefs and wanting to express, um, you know, what she's feeling. And so we're seeing this now um, more than ever before, before any royal that has come before her, just really talking about what's going on behind the scenes, talking about her emotions and her feelings. You know, she said she tried really hard over the past year to keep that, um, you know, British stiff upper, upper lip, and she found it to be actually quite damaging internally. So she is now using this time to, to really say what's going on. Do you think that people will respect her more? Now that she did this interview? You no, know, I think this is really humanizing hearts, humanizing Harry, and of course, you know, it's impossible to watch us and not feel compassion uh, for what they're going through. It does follow in the trend that they've been at, in terms of being open about mental health and being yes. open about dealing with emotions and things like that. 
Their interview is revealing, mm -hmm. kind of different though, in terms of the history of the Royals and how they deal with media scrutiny. Talk about how this yeah. is in contrast to the others. So there is a long British royal tradition of just really kind of putting your head down, writing out this criticism, not uh, commenting on it directly. So we haven't really you know, seen any modern royals, certainly not the Queen, Charles or William. Of course, Diana, you know, she opened up really an explosive interview with Panorama in the 90s to talk about the dissolution of her marriage things that were going on and so we're kind of seeing Harry follow suit in this and really opening up talking about uh, the tabloid scrutiny and, and Meghan as well. Yeah, and Harry's drawing some parallels between you know, his his mom, the late Princess Diana, and what Meghan is going through. So talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredibly raw what he's going through, and he's still obviously, um, you know, really affected by that. He was 12 years old when his mother died, a really vulnerable age, and he says every time he sees a flash, here's a click, he's taken immediately back to, you know, what his mother went through. Both he and William have talked about coming home when they were kids, seeing Diana crying over what she had experienced with the paparazzi and so then to see that his wife is uh, you know facing negativity in the media of course he's triggered and he wants to do everything he can to protect her it was revealed that William Prince William even reached out to Harry and Meghan after that documentary yeah. interview aired worried about them right. um, a biographer has said before you know the Royals don't necessarily support each other that well historically in some ways do you think that's gonna change now well, yeah, he did. After he reached that, uh, watched the documentary we're hearing, he reached out to see if they're okay um, because it was very jarring. You know, as far as whether it'll bring them closer, Harry said himself, they're, they're brothers, they will always be brothers. They are kind of going their separate ways right now. They're not spending as much time together, but he still has a lot of love for him. He loves him dearly. Um, you know, it, they are going different ways. You know, Harry and Meghan are taking a step outside the traditional route, and they're, they're really kind of looking to outside help right now that the royals don't ever do. That's an interesting piece of it. Even publicists yeah. or PR firms in the exactly. U.S., right, mm -hmm. which is really unique for the royals. Yeah, it's clear that they're feeling like they're not getting anywhere within right. the royal house. So they're reaching out to friends, um, PR professionals in the U.S. to help them navigate this. Talk about how the couple is kind of moving ahead and cementing their own path in contrast to what, say, William and Kate are doing. Harry and Meghan are doing their thing. Yeah, so, you know, in addition to taking six weeks off coming up, um, you know, that will be really important for them to take some time to really regroup, decide where they want to go next. Um, it's likely they're going to spend a lot of time in the U.S. Uh, around Thanksgiving with Meghan's mom in L.A. And that will give them the time to kind of, um, you know, ground themselves, center themselves, spend some time as a family, figure out their next move. Harry has said, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they may find themselves somewhere outside of Britain. You know, they love spending time in Africa. He even said Cape Town would be an interesting base for them. She's got the um, LA connection. Yeah. Maybe they just head to LA. Yeah. Who knows? Extended times <laughs> in the U.S. I think we'll start to see more and more. Yeah. yeah. So there's been a lot of heart-wrenching things revealed about what Harry and Meghan are going through. There are some sweet things, yeah. too, right? No, there were some really uh, light hearted moments. You know, we learned Megan's nickname for Harry H, uh, which we knew she started calling him that back when they were dating, which is really sweet. And we got some great details about Archie's time in Africa and how they said he really found his voice there. He was, you know, <laughs> talking more, you know, um, you know, just sort of making a lot of noise and that he seemed happier there more than more than ever. And, you know, Megan did say, you know, despite everything that's going on, the changes that she's ex um, kind of experienced becoming a mom and, and a wife, she said she's she's feeling really positive about this because she has what she says, you know, the best husband and the, and the best baby. So yeah. I love that they call Archie Bubba. It's my yes. favorite thing <laughs> of all time. <laughs> and I don't know if anyone has made this genius observation. She calls him H. She's M. That's H and M. H oh, okay. <laughs> Mind blown. Wow. The things that oh, I discover every time we talk. That's right. I apologize, everyone. All right, thank you so much, Erin. Thank it's good you. to talk to you. And for more on Megan and Harry's emotional interview, pick up the latest issue of People on Newsstands Friday. The new Netflix series Daybreak follows a group of high school kids. They like to play games, have fun together. They're navigating a post-apocalyptic world, though, in the show. Yes, when we sat down with the cast, they described the show as Mad Max meets Ferris Bueller's Day Off meets Zombieland. Sounds like it would be kind of hard to pull off. It does, but don't worry, because they had a little help from Ferris Bueller himself, Matthew Broderick. He stars as the high school principal. He was quick to offer some advice where needed. One of my first interactions with, with Matthew was uh, we were sitting on cast chairs, and he kind of looks over at me, and he's like, so... Been talking to camera, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, man. Um, That's amazing. 
it's it's odd, you know, it's difficult. And he's like, what do you think is the, what's the hardest part for you about it? And I was, um, in the lens, when you look in the camera, you can kind of, the lens is a little bit reflective, so you, you see, can yourself. see yourself. Yeah. And so like that throws me off immediately, because then I'm starting to like second guess like what I'm doing, what my face looks, all that stuff. And I think, uh, and before I could even say like the fact that I could see myself, he was like, the fact that you can see yourself. <laughs> oh really, he's like yeah, finishing, he's like, like he's exactly like, what is like, that was the That was the thing that threw him off, you know, at first, but you know, you worked through that and you know, it was ended up working out, but. yeah. It was definitely, you know, difficult at first, you know, sure. something to get used to. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. Something we'd be surprised to know about Matthew Broderick. He loves coffee. Yeah. That's, that's my Matthew Broderick. Yeah. Just constantly going back. Us at Craft Services, drinking <laughs> yeah. coffee all, all the, the time. time. Okay. <laughs> Having our little crafty talks. That's yeah. it. That's it was fun. the best. He knows how to floss because oh, yeah. of that. Oh, yeah. Because of well, he knows about how that. to floss because we taught him. Oh, the dance floor. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. He's very good. He's really good at it. Yeah. 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 He can do it. I'd like to see Matthew Broderick flossing. I, I would know. too. Uh, we all know surviving high school can be hard enough as it is. Throw in a little apocalypse, things get complicated. <laughs> so he asked, what advice would they give to people in high school now? What Daybreak really is about is, um, you know, like we all have had a high school experience and you will have one. Um, and I think that if everybody remembers like their high school experience, whether some parts of it were good or some parts of it were bad, everybody kind of navigated like the highways of high school, making friends, losing friends, but ultimately, you know, you found this group of people that you were your friends and that kind of got you through the day and that you'd lean on when times were hard. And that's kind of what Daybreak is about, is about finding your tribe and uh, finding the people that help you get through hard times. I think also it's about like being authentic to yourself and, you know, especially now, I think for kids at high school, there's so many channels telling you what to be and who to be. And I think it's important to realize, and what the show does really well, is like that people will love you for who you are if you just stay to that. Really great advice there, but what about advice for surviving in a post-apocalyptic world? Might be surprised at their delicious tip. We had a survival guy come in and Did teach you? us. Uh, yeah. Okay, right. And he, he was <laughs> all like... I remember is, he said, you've got to stock up on Twinkies, which I found out is like a American cake with yeah, no, right. right? <laughs> which they, by the way, I think they've been discontinued, but oh, so you yeah. better <laughs> find them somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but why, because they last forever? No, kind of thing? because you can light them, they're really good firewood. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. That's probably, That's crazy. Wow, that is yeah. interesting. Because there's so much, there's so much oil in, in the world. Twinkies, who knew? The cast was so much fun. We've been played a little game of Would You Rather based on a few things that happened in the show. Watch. All right, little game of Would You Rather. All right, would you rather belong to the meanest tribe or fight it out on your own? Fight it out, fight on, it my out. Own. on your own. Fight it out on my own. Fight it out. Wow, yeah. no one wants to be a part of the mean tribe. <laughs> Weapon, samurai sword or flamethrower? Flamethrower! Samurai sword. I would take a samurai sword. Just because what if the gas runs out of the... Right, okay, yeah. I'm still gonna say flamethrower. I'm gonna stay true to my roots. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ali. Did you, you get stay any, like, cool training with, like, weapon stuff? I got crossbow training. Yeah? Yeah, which is crossbow. really cool. It's crossbow. I learned how to, like, carry it and stuff and how to aim it and all that cool You're pretty stuff. decent. I mean, I I think I did yeah, a good job. I, I did. Considering. It was, yeah. it was pretty heavy, honestly. It was really heavy. All right, who of the group, of the cast, is most likely to actually survive an apocalypse? Who is the most handy, survivalist, scrappy? <laughs> John would be good. Yeah. Dante would be really good. Although Ali, I believe that because you're you were slow to give your advice. Like you're very protective. <laughs> She's got the secrets, right? right? Keep it, keep She's it close to the She's also not She's not scared of like anything either. Yeah. 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 Apart like from real life, advice. you're not. <laughs> no, unless there's a rat. A rat. A rat. <laughs> That's a rat. <laughs> Would you rather have to eat a bowl of maggots once or only ever eat cereal for the rest of your life? Oh. Cereal. Oh, cereal. 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 No, I eat cereal for every meal already. Yeah. I oh, think I'd go cereal. with maggots just because yeah. I want sushi and stuff. Right, yeah. so you can, it, it, right, the maggots once and then you do everything, everything you else want the rest yeah. of your oh, life. Oh, okay. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. How big's the bowl? Uh, it's decent. It's a decent size. It's a cereal yeah, sized bowl. If you're sick, you're sick. I'm just going to risk it at one time. Okay, we'll go one bowl. Can it be different types of cereal? Oh, that's a good question. This is getting complicated. I'm going to say it's only Fruity Pebbles, so I don't know. Uh, Ooh, couldn't you go with Coco? <laughs> In this week's People Magazine, we are saluting America's veterans, including those heroes on the home front whose service didn't end on the front lines. And joining us via Skype is Fabian Salazar, a U.S. Navy service member who adopted his old combat dog, Max. Salazar and Max served in Afghanistan together. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Good to see you. 
Hey, good to see you too. Thank you. Yeah, and Max is with you right now. Such a good boy. <laughs> you credit yeah. Max for saving your life on multiple occasions in Afghanistan, including the time Max warned you about an enemy combatant sneaking up behind you. Can you tell us that story? Uh, yeah, pretty much that one instance. Um, pretty much we were just engaged with the enemy and there's a couple of us pinned down in a field and we are all facing one direction and Max just happened to be pulling in the opposite direction. Whether it was intentional or not, it caused me to react and to turn the opposite way. And that's when I noticed that there was somebody, um, somebody behind us, which allowed us to go ahead and take those measures to make sure that we were all safe. So because of his actions, again, intentional or not, he saved our lives, wow. caused us to react and we were all good to go that day. So he doesn't know what he did, but he did a pretty good job that day. Yeah, and then you and Max were separated for years once you returned from Afghanistan. Do you remember the goodbye with him and, and kind of what was going through your mind at the time? You know, it was it was such a quick goodbye. And it was, um, uh, it was like, it happened so fast. And I wasn't really thinking that, hey, this is the last time I'm gonna get to see my dog. And it wasn't until I went to, uh, my next place of duty that I started like, wow, how's Max doing? And I was like, I didn't get to say goodbye. Even I told my family, I was like, you know, it just kind of dropped everything and left. And um, I really just got to say goodbye to him. He just kind of saw me. He's thinking, well, maybe I'll see you the next time. Um, but the next day I was already gone, you know, and pretty much after that, the memories start coming back of exactly what Max did. And I'm like, man, I can't believe I just left him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you when know, you, not even a proper goodbye. Yeah, when you heard you had a chance to adopt Max, what was your initial reaction? Oh, uh, I was ecstatic. Yeah, I, I had to get family approval. My wife had to buy off on it because he was a little quirky in the very beginning. Um, he was a little bit, a little bit crazy. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll admit it. But he, um, <laughs> she, when she gave the go ahead, it was pretty good. But we did have a scare for a moment because uh, one of my former buddies, he did tell me that he had a potential cancer scare. And we were worried that we may not even get to adopt him if the cancer was uh, was gonna get more aggressive, but luckily he got the all clear, which we were able to move on to the adoption process once he retired. Yeah, so now that Max is part of the family, uh, you know, we hear that you have this game that you like to play. Wanted to kind of know what's going on with that game that you play with him and the family plays. So I like to play hide and seek with him because he, um, my wife today actually said he looked like Bambi and I was like, no, he does not look like Bambi, but he, he does run like a deer and I like to play hide and seek. So I'll run into a dark room and he'll come look for me. And as soon as I pop out, he'll take off prancing around the table. So I start chasing him until I, um, <laughs> until I find him and then he starts chasing me and we just go back and forth until he's like, okay, wait a minute. I'm 95 pounds. I can't do this no more. <laughs> you also told our producer that Max likes to force his love on you guys, kind of like a cat. That's what you said. Can you explain that a little bit? So he, um, <laughs> he'll cooperate right now. So if I'm sitting around and my arm is just up, uh, I'm watching the ta uh, TV or whatever, just didn't have a conversation. He likes to force his head right through, pretty much say, hey, look pet me, I'm here, love on me. Yeah, and we, we heard that Max is pretty protective about your family now, just like he was about you previously. It's kind of in his nature and his training. How does he show his protection now? So anytime someone comes to the, the door, they ring the doorbell, he alerts and runs right at the door. Uh, sometimes he'll run into it, there's glass there, and it's just warning the people like, hey, look, you're in my property and I got to protect my family. And what do your family and your friends think about Max? I mean, they must love the fact he brought you home safely. They do. First, my family is just grateful for him. Uh, my wife puts up with all the shedding and says, <laughs> he's lucky he's your retired war dog. <laughs> and we love him. He sheds a lot, but he definitely has a place in our heart. How are the kids with the dog? Um, my three-year-old is always demanding to play and says, come on, puppy, play with me, puppy. <laughs> And uh, his name is Noah, and he's just chasing him around the table. Max eventually just gives up. My three-year-old gets mad and is trying to force him with treats or whatever just to get him to come out. Um, my 11-year-old, he's got the big heart, and he's just a real grateful kid saying, you know, thank you, Max, for bringing me home. Uh, and my daughter pretty much just took him on as I will groom him and I will love him forever. You know, so they, uh, they, took, they took really well to him. 
Well, also, we, we mentioned um, his health issues before. How is he today in terms of that? So what I told you, I think it was your producer, I told him um, in the service, he's about 65 pounds of pure chiseled war machine. Uh, now he's 95 pounds of happiness. He's got a good clean bill of health. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us, Fabian. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you for doing this, you know, for these guys. Um, these guys are combat vets, you know, and we appreciate any time we get to tell a story. Our fallen handlers, real quick, Sean Braces, Mike Brodsky, they got a good story with as working dog handlers, you know, and Max has his story to tell, and I thank Max for bringing me home. Well, we really appreciate you sharing yours with us, and thanks for your service. Oh, thank you guys. Have a good day. You too. All right, we're taking one last look at our question of the day. In honor of her new song, which is taking the internet by storm, Lose You to Love Me, we've been asking you to vote on your favorite Selena Gomez single of all time. Ooh, this is hard. Uh, well, I guess that's the new favorite. Okay, <laughs> Recency <so> bias. <laughs> hands to I myself. That's our of those for every four, poll. Yeah, I know. Of those four, <laughs> Hands to Myself is probably my favorite. I like It Ain't Me. Um, I like Come and Get It. That's a fun one. Yeah. It's just like the kind of, it like really gets in there. I like It Ain't Me. It's not on the poll, but it's also a really good song. Yeah. We have a write in vote from one Twitter user for The Heart Wants What It Wants. That's a good one, too. Hard not to sing it. Yeah. We'll be asking you a new question of the day tomorrow on People Now, so tune in for that. Coming up tomorrow, we're joined live by Dog the Bounty Hunter, Dwayne Chapman. We're going to check in on how he has been doing since the passing of his wife, Beth, and his own recent health scare as well. Plus, Tim Robbins reveals whether he and Morgan Freeman will ever team up again as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of Shawshank Redemption. Woo. Thanks for watching. For now, we leave you with one last thing from Bindi, Robert, and Terry Irwin. Bye. Bye, guys. G'day, G'day we're, we're the Irwins, Irwins and, and this, this is One, one last, last Thing. Our last family vacation, besides doing press, was probably when we were on our annual crocodile research trip in far north Queensland. He is such a powerful croc. He's a really big boy. Another vacation was to Arizona to catch wild rattlesnakes. Oh, that was fun. And that just so happens to be on Crikey, it's the Owen season two. I'm catching my first rattlesnake. The last time you challenged yourself. Can I defer to you on this one? Yes. Because I have to tell you, when you did Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> and one, and you never danced, even <laughs> like one of those cool. little five-year-old ballerina things, you never <laughs> danced. It was awe-inspiring. My last irrational fear was... Of oh, girls. What was... Yes. Oh. <laughs> He's single, by the way. One irrational fear one irrational is fear. of elevators. <laughs> Second irrational fear is of scary movies. I have this irrational fear about choking, mm -hmm. and so you guys never got to chew gum. Nope. <laughs>